Essay four, part one of Unto This Last. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Unto This Last. Four Essays on the Principles of Political Economy by John Ruskin. Essay four, Ad Valorem, part one. We just saw that payment of labor consisted in a sum of money which would approximately obtain equivalent labor at a future time. We have now to examine the means of obtaining such equivalents. Which question involves the definition of value, wealth, price, and produce? None of these terms are yet defined so as to be understood by the public. But the last, produce, which one might have thought the clearest of all, is, in use, the most ambiguous and the examination of the kind of ambiguity attendant on its present employment will best open the way to our work. In his chapter on capital, Mr. J. S. Mill instances, as a capitalist, a hardware manufacturer, who, having intended to spend a certain portion of the proceeds on his business in buying plate and jewels, changes his mind, and pays it as wages to additional workpeople. The effect is stated by Mr. Mill to be that, more food is appropriated to the consumption of productive laborers. Footnote. Book 1, Chapter 4, Section 1. End footnote. Now, I do not ask, though, had I written this paragraph, it would surely have been asked of me, what is to become of the silversmiths? If they are truly unproductive persons, we will acquiesce in their extinction. And though in another part of the same passage, the hardware merchant is supposed also to dispense with a number of servants, whose food is thus set free for productive purposes, I do not inquire what will be the effect, painful or otherwise, upon the servants, of this emancipation of their food. But I very seriously inquire why ironware is productive, and silverware is not. That the merchant consumes the one, and sells the other, certainly does not constitute the difference, unless it can be shown, which indeed I perceive it to be becoming daily more and more the aim of tradesmen to show, that commodities are made to be sold, and not to be consumed. The merchant is an agent of conveyance to the consumer in one case, and is himself the consumer in the other, but the laborers are in either case equally productive, since they have produced goods to the same value, if the hardware and the plate are both goods. Footnote. If Mr. Mill had wished to show the difference in result between consumption and sale, he should have represented the hardware merchant as consuming his own goods instead of selling them, similarly the silver merchant as consuming his own goods instead of welling them. Had he done this, he would have made his position clearer, though less tenable, and perhaps this was the position he really intended to take, tacitly involving his theory, elsewhere stated, and shown in the sequel of this paper to be false, that demand for commodities is not demand for labor. But, by the most diligent scrutiny of the paragraph now under examination, I cannot determine whether it is a fallacy pure and simple, or the half of one fallacy supported by the whole of a greater one, so that I treat it here on the kinder assumption that it is one fallacy only. End footnote. And what distinction separates them? It is indeed possible that in the comparative estimate of the moralist, with which Mr. Mill says political economy has nothing to do, Book 3, Chapter 1, Section 2, a steel fork might appear a more substantial production than a silver one. We may grant also that knives, no less than forks, are good produce, and scythes and plowshares serviceable articles. But how of bayonets? Supposing the hardware merchant to effect large sales of these, by help of the setting free of the food of his servants and his silversmith, is he still employing productive laborers, or, in Mr. Mill's words, laborers who increase the stock of permanent means of enjoyment? Book 1, Chapter 3, Section 4. Or if, instead of bayonets, he supplies bombs, will not the absolute and final enjoyment of even these energetically produced articles, each of which costs ten pounds, I take Mr. Helps's estimate in his essay on war, be dependent on a proper choice of time and place for their infantment? Choice, that is to say, depending on those philosophical considerations with which political economy has nothing to do? Footnote. 
Also, when the wrought silver vases of Spain were dashed to fragments by our custom-house officers, because bullion might be imported free of duty, but not brains, was the axe that broke them productive? The artist who wrought them unproductive? Or, again, if the woodman's axe is productive, is the executioner's? As also, if the hemp of a cable be productive, does not the productiveness of hemp in a halter depend on its moral more than its material application? End footnote. I should have regretted the need of pointing out inconsistency in any portion of Mr. Mill's work, had not the value of his work proceeded from its inconsistencies. He deserves honor among economists by inadvertently disclaiming the principles which he states, and tacitly introducing the moral considerations with which he declares his science has no connection. Many of his chapters are, therefore, true and valuable, and the only conclusions of his which I have to dispute are those which follow from his premises. Thus, the idea which lies at the root of the passage we have just been examining, namely, that labor applied to produce luxuries will not support so many persons as labor applied to produce useful articles, is entirely true. But the instance given fails, and in four directions of failure at once, because Mr. Mill has not defined the real meaning of usefulness. The definition which he has given, capacity to satisfy a desire, or serve a purpose, Book 3, Chapter 1, Section 2, applies equally to the iron and silver, while the true definition which he has not given, but which nevertheless underlies the false verbal definition in his mind, and comes out once or twice by accident, as in the words, any support to life or strength, in one three five, applies to some articles of iron, but not to others, and to some articles of silver, but not to others. It applies to ploughs, but not to bayonets, and to forks, but not to filigree. Filigree, that is to say, generally, ornament dependent on complexity, not on art. The eliciting of the true definitions will give us the reply to our first question, what is value, respecting which, however, we must first hear the popular statements. The word value, when used without adjunct, always means, in political economy, value and exchange. Mill, 3, 1, 2. So that, if two ships cannot exchange their rudders, their rudders are, in political economic language, of no value to either. But the subject of political economy is wealth. Preliminary Remarks, page 1 and wealth consists of all useful and agreeable objects which possess exchangeable value. Preliminary Remarks, page 10. It appears, then, according to Mr. Mill, that usefulness and agreeableness underlie the exchange value, and must be ascertained to exist in the thing, before we can esteem it an object of wealth. Now, the economical usefulness of a thing depends not merely on its own nature, but on the number of people who can and will use it. A horse is useless, and therefore unsaleable, if no one can ride, a sword if no one can strike, and meat if no one can eat. Thus every material utility depends on its relative human capacity. Similarly, the agreeableness of a thing depends not merely on its own likableness, but on the number of people who can be got to like it. The relative agreeableness, and therefore saleableness, of a pot of the smallest ale, and of Adonis painted by a running brook, depends virtually on the opinion of Demos, in the shape of Christopher Sly. That is to say, the agreeableness of a thing depends on its relatively human disposition. Therefore, political economy, being a science of wealth, must be a science respecting human capacities and dispositions. But moral considerations have nothing to do with political economy. Therefore, moral considerations have nothing to do with human capacities and dispositions. Footnote. These statements sound crude in their brevity, but will be found of the utmost importance when they are developed. Thus, in the above instance, economists have never perceived that disposition to buy is a wholly moral element in demand. That is to say, when you give a man a half-crown, it depends on his disposition whether he is rich or poor with it, whether he will buy disease, ruin, and hatred, or buy health, advancement, and domestic love and thus the agreeableness or exchange value of every offered commodity depends on production, not merely of the commodity, but of buyers of it, therefore on the education of buyers, and on all the moral elements by which their disposition to buy, this or that, is formed. 
I will illustrate and expand into final consequences every one of these definitions in its place. At present they can only be given with extremest brevity, for in order to put the subject at once in a connected form before the reader, I have thrown into one the opening definitions of four chapters, namely, of that on value, ad valorem, on price, thirty pieces, on production, demeter, and on economy, the law of the house. End footnote. I do not wholly like the look of this conclusion from Mr. Mill's statements. Let us try Mr. Ricardo's. Utility is not the measure of the exchangeable value, though it is absolutely essential to it. Chapter 1, Section 1. Essential in what degree, Mr. Ricardo? There may be greater and less degrees of utility. Meat, for instance, may be so good as to be fit for any one to eat, or so bad as to be fit for no one to eat. What is the exact degree of goodness which is essential to its exchangeable value, but not the measure of it? How good must the meat be, in order to possess any exchangeable value, and how bad must it be? I wish this were a settled question in London markets, in order to possess none. There appears to be some hitch, I think, in the working even of Mr. Ricardo's principles. But let him take his own example. Suppose that in the early stages of society the bows and arrows of the hunter were of equal value with the implements of the fisherman. Under such circumstances the value of the deer, the produce of the hunter's day's labor, would be exactly equal to the value of the fish, the product of the fisherman's day's labor. The comparative value of the fish and game would be entirely regulated by the quantity of labor realized in each. Ricardo, Chapter 3, On Value. Indeed, Therefore, if the fisherman catches one sprat, and the huntsman one deer, one sprat will be equal in value to one deer, but if the fisherman catches no sprat, and the huntsman two deer, no sprat will be equal in value to two deer? Nay, but, Mr. Ricardo's supporters may say, he means, on an average, if the average product of a day's work of fisher and hunter be one fish and one deer, the one fish will always be equal in value to the one deer. Might I inquire the species of fish, whale, or whale-bait? Footnote. Perhaps it may be said, in farther support of Mr. Ricardo, that he meant, when the utility is constant or given, the price varies as the quantity of labor. If he meant this, he should have said it. But had he meant it, he could hardly have missed the necessary result, that utility would be one measure of price, which he expressly denies it to be, and that to prove saleableness he had to prove a quantity of utility, as well as a given quantity of labor, to wit, his own instance, that the deer and fish would each feed the same number of men, for the same number of days, with equal pleasure to their palates. The fact is, he did not know what he meant himself. The general idea, which he had derived from commercial experience, without being able to recognize it, was that when the demand is constant, the price varies as the quantity of labor required for the production, or, using the formula I gave in the last paper, when y is constant, x y varies as x. But demand never is, nor can be, ultimately constant. If x varies distinctly, for as price rises, consumers fall away, and, as soon as there is a monopoly, and all scarcity is a form of monopoly, so that every commodity is affected occasionally by some color of monopoly, y becomes the most influential condition of the price. Thus the price of a painting depends less on its merits than on the interest taken in it by the public. The price of singing less on the labor of the singer than the number of persons who desire to hear him, and the price of gold less on the scarcity which affects it in common with ceridium or iridium than on the sunlit color and unalterable purity by which it attracts the admiration and answers the trust of mankind. It must be kept in mind, however, that I use the word demand in a somewhat different sense from economists usually. They mean by it the quantity of a thing sold. I mean by it the force of the buyer's capable intention to buy. In good English, a person's demand signifies not what he gets, but what he asks for. Economists do not notice that objects are not valued by absolute bulk or weight but by such bulk and weight as is necessary to bring them into use. They say, for instance, that water bears no price in the market. It is true that a cupful does not, but a lake does, just as a handful of dust does not, but an acre does. And were it possible to make even the possession of the cupful or handful permanent, 
i.e., to find a place for them, the earth and sea would be bought up for handfuls and cupfuls. End footnote. It would be a waste of time to purpose these fallacies farther. We will seek for a true definition. Much store has been set for centuries upon the use of our English classical education. It were to be wished that our well-educated merchants recall to mind always this much of their Latin schooling, that the nominative of valorum, a word already sufficiently familiar to them, is valor, a word which, therefore, ought to be familiar to them. Valor, from valere, to be well or strong, strong in life if a man, or valiant, strong for life if a thing, or valuable, to be valuable, therefore, is to avail towards life. A truly valuable or availing thing is that which leads to life with its whole strength. In proportion as it does not lead to life, or as its strength is broken, it is less valuable. In proportion as it leads away from life, it is unvaluable or malignant. The value of a thing, therefore, is independent of opium, and of quantity. Think what you will of it, gain how much you may of it, the value of the thing itself is neither greater nor less. Forever it avails or avails not. No estimate can raise, no disdain repress, the power which it holds from the maker of things and men. The real science of political economy, which has yet to be distinguished from the bastard science, as medicine from witchcraft, and astronomy from astrology, is that which teaches nations to desire and labor for the things that lead to life, and which teaches them to scorn and destroy the things that lead to destruction. And if, in a state of infancy, they supposed indifferent things, such as excrescences of shellfish and pieces of blue and red stone, to be valuable, and spent large measures of the labor which ought to be employed for the extension and ennobling of life, in diving or digging for them, and cutting them into various shapes, or if, in the same state of infancy, they imagine precious and beneficent things, such as air, light, and cleanliness, to be valueless, or if, finally, they imagine the conditions of their own existence, by which alone they can truly possess or use anything, such, for instance, as peace, trust, and love, to be prudently exchangeable, when the markets offer, for gold, iron, or excrescences of shells, the great and only science of political economy teaches them, in all these cases, what is vanity, and what substance, and how the service of death, the lord of waste, and of eternal emptiness, differs from the service of wisdom, the lady of saving, and of eternal fullness. She who has said, I will cause those that love me to inherit substance, and I will fill their treasures. The lady of saving, in a profounder sense than that of the saving spank, though that is a good one, Madonna della Salute, lady of health, which, though commonly spoken of as if separate from wealth, is indeed a part of wealth. This word, wealth, it will be remembered, is the next we have to define. To be wealthy, says Mr. Mill, is to have a large stock of useful articles. I accept this definition. Only let us perfectly understand it. My opponents often lament my not giving them enough logic. I fear I must at present use a little more than they will like. But this business of a political economy is no light one, and we must allow no loose terms in it. We have, therefore, to ascertain in the above definition, first, what is the meaning of having, or the nature of possession? Then, what is the meaning of useful, or the nature of utility? And first of possession. At the crossing of the transepts of Milan Cathedral has lain, for three hundred years, the embalmed body of St. Carlo Borromeo. It holds a golden crossier, and has a cross of emeralds upon its breast. Admitting the crossier and emeralds to be useful articles, is the body to be considered as having them? Do they, in the politico-economical sense of property, belong to it? If not, and if we may, therefore, conclude generally that a dead body cannot possess property, what degree and period of animation in the body will render possession possible? And thus, lately in a wreck of a Californian ship, one of the passengers fastened a belt about him with two hundred pounds of gold in it, with which he was found afterwards at the bottom. Now, as he was sinking, had he the gold, or had the gold him? Footnote. Compare George Herbert, the church porch, stands at twenty-eight. End footnote. And if, instead of sinking him in the sea by its weight, the gold had struck him on the forehead, and thereby caused incurable disease, suppose palsy or insanity, 
Would the gold in that case have been more a possession than in the first? Without pressing the inquiry up through instances of gradually increasing vital power over the gold, which I will, however, give if they are asked for, I presume the reader will see that possession, or having, is not an absolute, but a gradated power, and consists not only in the quantity or nature of the thing possessed, but also, and in a greater degree, in its suitableness to the person possessing it, and in his vital power to use it. And our definition of wealth, expanded, becomes the possession of useful articles, which we can use. This is a very serious change. For wealth, instead of depending merely on a have, is thus seen to depend on a can. Gladiator's death on a habit, but soldier's victory and state salvation on a quoperum imposit. Live seven six, and what we reasoned of not only as accumulation of material is seen to demand also accumulation of capacity. So much for our verb. Next for our adjective. What is the meaning of useful? The inquiry is closely connected with the last. For what is capable of use in the hands of some persons is capable in the hands of others of the opposite of use, called commonly from use or abuse. And it depends on the person, much more than on the article, whether its usefulness or abusefulness will be the quality developed in it. Thus wine, which the Greeks in their Bacchus made rightly the type of all passion, and which, when used, cheereth God and man, that is to say, strengthens both the divine life or reasoning power, and the earthy or carnal power of man, yet when abused becomes Dionysus, hurtful especially to the divine part of man or reason. And again the body itself, being equally liable to use and to abuse, and when rightly disciplined serviceable to the state, both for war and labor, but not when disciplined or abused valueless to the state, and capable only of continuing the private or single existence of the individual, and that but feebly, the Greeks called such a body an idiotic or private body, from their words signifying a person employed in no way directly useful to the state, whence finally our idiot, meaning a person entirely occupied with his own concerns. Hence it follows that if a thing is to be useful, it must not be only of an availing nature, but in availing hands, or, in accurate terms, usefulness is value in the hands of the valiant, so that this science of wealth being, as we have just seen, when regarded as the science of accumulation, accumulative of capacity as well as of material, when regarded as the science of distribution, as distribution is not absolute, but discriminate, not of every thing to every man, but of the right thing to the right man, a difficult science dependent on more than arithmetic. Wealth, therefore, is the possession of the valuable by the valiant, and in considering it as a power existing in the nation, the two elements, the value of the thing and the valor of its possessor, must be estimated together. Whence it appears that many of the persons commonly considered wealthy are in reality no more wealthy than the locks of their own strong-boxes are, they being inherently and eternally incapable of wealth, and operating for the nation, in an economical point of view, either as pools of dead water, and eddies in a stream, which, so long as the stream flows, are useless, or serve only to drown people, but may become of importance in a state of stagnation, should the stream dry, or else as dams in a river, of which the ultimate service depends not on the dam, but the miller, or else as mere accidental stays and impediments, acting not as wealth, for we ought to have a correspondent term, as ilth, causing various devastations, and of trouble around them in all directions, or lastly act not at all, but are merely animated conditions of delay, no use being possible of anything they have until they are dead, in which condition they are nevertheless often useful as delays, and impedimentia, if a nation is apt to move too fast." This being so, the difficulty of the true science of political economy lies not merely in the need of developing manly character to deal with material value, but in the fact that, while the manly character and material value only form wealth by their conjunction, they have nevertheless a mutually destructive operation on each other. For the manly character is apt to ignore or even cast away the material value, whence that of Pope, 
sure of qualities demanding praise, more go to ruin fortunes than to raise. And, on the other hand, the material value is apt to undermine the manly character, so that it must be our work, in the issue, to examine what evidence there is of the effect of wealth on the minds of its possessor. Also, what kind of person it is who usually sets himself to obtain wealth, and succeeds in doing so, and whether the world owes more gratitude to rich or poor men, either for their moral influence upon it, or for chief goods, discoveries, and practical advancements. I may, however, anticipate future conclusions, so far as to state that in a community regulated only by laws of demand and supply, but protected from open violence, the persons who become rich are, generally speaking, industrious, resolute, proud, covetous, prompt, methodical, sensible, unimaginative, insensitive, and ignorant. The persons who remain poor are the entirely foolish, the entirely wise, the idle, the reckless, the humble, the thoughtful, the dull, the imaginative, the sensitive, the well-informed, the improvident, the irregularly and impulsively wicked, the clumsy knave, the open thief, and the entirely merciful, just, and godly person. Footnote. Plutarch, 582. It would but weaken the grand words to lean on the preceding ones. End footnote. Thus far, then, of wealth. Next we have to ascertain the nature of price, that is to say, of exchange value, and its expression by currencies. Note first of exchange. There can be no profit in it. It is only in labor that there can be profit, that is to say, a making in advance, or making in favor of, from proficio. In exchange there is only advantage, i.e., a bringing of vantage or power over the exchanging persons. Thus one man, by sowing and reaping, turns one measure of corn into two measures, that is profit. Another, by digging and forging, turns one spade into two spades, that is profit. But the man who has two measures of corn wants sometimes to dig, and the man who has two spades wants sometimes to eat. They exchange the gained grain for the gained tool, and both are the better for the exchange. But though there is much advantage in the transaction, there is no profit. Nothing is constructed or produced. Only that which had been before constructed is given to the person by whom it can be used. If labor is necessary to effect the exchange, that labor is, in reality, involved in the production, and, like all other labor, bears profit. Whatever number of men are concerned in the manufacture or in the conveyance have a share in the profit. But neither the manufacture nor the conveyance are the exchange, and in the exchange itself there is no profit. There may, however, be acquisition, which is a very different thing. If in the exchange one man is able to give what cost him little labor, for what has cost the other much, he acquires a certain quantity of the produce of the other's labor. And precisely what he acquires the other loses. In mercantile language, the person who thus acquires is commonly said to have made a profit. And I believe that many of our merchants are seriously under the impression that it is possible for everybody, somehow, to make a profit in this manner. Whereas, by the unfortunate constitution of the world we live in, the laws both of matter and motion have quite rigorously forbidden universal acquisition of this kind. Profit, or material gain, is attainable only by construction, or by discovery, not by exchange. Whenever material gain follows exchange, for every plus there is a precisely equal minus. Unhappily for the progress of the science of political economy, the plus quantities, or, if I may be allowed to coin an awkward plural, the pluses, make a very positive and venerable appearance in the world, so that every one is eager to learn the science which produces results so magnificent, whereas the minuses have, on the other hand, a tendency to retire into back streets, and other places of shade, or even to get themselves wholly and finally put out of sight in graves, which renders the algebra of this science peculiar, and difficultly legible, a large number of its negative signs being written by the account-keeper in a kind of red ink, which starvation thins and makes strangely pale, or even quite invisible ink, for the present. The science of exchange, or, as I hear it has been proposed to call it, of, of catalactics, considered as one of gain, is therefore simply nugatory. But considered as one of acquisition, it is a very curious science, differing in its data and basis from every other science known. 
Thus, if I can exchange a needle with a savage for a diamond, my power of doing so depends either on the savage's ignorance of social arrangements in Europe, or on his want of power to take advantage of them, by selling the diamond to any one else for more needles. If, farther, I make the bargain as completely advantageous to myself as possible, by giving the savage a needle with no eye in it, reaching, thus, a sufficiently satisfactory type of the perfect operation of catalactic science, the advantage to me in the entire transaction depends wholly upon the ignorance, powerlessness, or heedlessness of the person dealt with. Do away with these, and catalactic advantage becomes impossible. So far, therefore, as the science of exchange relates to the advantage of one of the exchanging persons only, it is founded on the ignorance or incapacity of the opposite person. Where these vanish, it also vanishes. It is therefore a science founded in nescience, and an art founded on artlessness. But all other sciences and arts, except this, have for their object the doing away with their opposite nescience and artlessness. This science, alone of sciences, must, by all available means, promulgate and prolong its opposite nescience. Therefore, the science itself is impossible. It is, therefore, peculiarly and alone the science of darkness, probably a bastard science, not by any means a divina scientia, but one begotten of another father, that father who, advising his children to turn stones into bread, is himself employed in turning bread into stones, and who, if you ask a fish of him, fish not being producible on his estate, can but give you a serpent. The general law, then, respecting just or economical exchange, is simply this. There must be advantage on both sides, or, if only advantage on one, at least no disadvantage on the other, to the persons exchanging, and just payment for his time, intelligence, and labor, to any intermediate person affecting the transaction, commonly called a merchant, and whatever advantage there is on either side, and whatever pay is given to the intermediate person, should be thoroughly known to all concerned. All attempt at concealment implies some practice of the opposite, or undivine science, founded on nescience. Whence another saying of the Jew merchants, As a nail between the stone joints, so doth sin stick fast between buying and selling. Which peculiar riveting of stone and timber, in men's dealings with each other, is again set forth in the house which was to be destroyed, timber and stones together, when Zechariah's roll, more probably curved sword, flew over it, the curse that goeth forth over all the earth upon every one that stealeth and holdeth himself guiltless, instantly followed by the vision of the great measure, the measure of the injustice of them in all the earth, with the weight of lead for its lid, and the woman, the spirit of wickedness within it, that is to say, wickedness hidden by dullness, and formalized outwardly into ponderously established cruelty. It shall be set upon its own base in the land of Babel. Zechariah 5, verse 11. I have hitherto carefully restricted myself, in speaking of exchange, to the use of the term advantage, but that term includes two ideas, the advantage, namely, of getting what we need, and that of getting what we wish for. Three-fourths of the demands existing in the world are romantic, founded on visions, idealisms, hopes, and affections, and the regulation of the purse is, in its essence, regulation of the imagination and the heart. Hence, the right discussion of the nature of price is a very high metaphysical and psychical problem, sometimes to be resolved only in a passionate manner, as by David in his counting the price of the water of the well by the gate of Bethlehem. But its first conditions are the following. The price of anything is the quantity of labor given by the person desiring it, in order to obtain possession of it. This price depends on four variable quantities. A the quantity of wish the purchaser has for the thing, opposed to a, the quantity of wish the seller has to keep it, b, the quantity of labor the purchaser can afford to obtain the thing opposed to b, the quantity of labor the seller can afford to keep it. These quantities are operative only in excess, i.e., the quantity of wish a means the quantity of wish for this thing, above wish for other things, and the quantity of work B means the quantity which can be spared to get this thing from the quantity needed to get other things. Phenomena of price, therefore, are intensely complex, curious, and interesting, too complex, however, to be examined yet, 
every one of them, when traced far enough, showing itself at last as a part of the bargain of the poor of the flock, or flock of slaughter. If you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. Zechariah 11, verse 12. But as the price of everything is to be calculated finally in labor, it is necessary to define the nature of that standard. Labor is the contest of the life of man with an opposite. The term life included his intellect, soul, and physical power, contending with question, difficulty, trial, or material force. Labor is of a higher or lower order, as it includes more or fewer of the elements of life. And labor of good quality, in any kind, includes always as much intellect and feeling as will fully and harmoniously regulate the physical force. In speaking of the value and price of labor, it is necessary always to understand labor of a given rank and quality, as we should speak of gold or silver of a given standard. Bad, that is, heartless, inexperienced, or senseless labor, cannot be valued. It is like gold of uncertain alloy or flawed iron. Footnote. Labor which is entirely good of its kind, that is to say, effective or efficient, the Greeks called weighable, translated usually as worthy, and because thus substantial and true, they called its price the honorable estimate of it, honorarium, this word being founded on their conception of true labor as a divine thing, to be honored with the kind of honor given to the gods, whereas the price of false labor, or of that which led away from life, was to be not honor but vengeance, for which they reserved another word, attributing the exaction of such a price to a peculiar goddess, called to Siphony, the requiter or quittance-taker of death, a person versed in the highest branches of arithmetic, and punctual in her habits, with whom accounts current have been opened also in modern days. End footnote. End of Essay 4, Part 1, From Unto This Last.